remembering past incarnations. No sooner do people learn of the principles of reincarnation than they not unnaturally want to trace out their own karmic record in the past. We must not dismiss this desire as mere idle curiosity, or foolish vanity though it may contain elements of both these factors in varying proportions. It is a very useful thing to have some idea of one's past incarnations, but if this knowledge is to yield its full value it is necessary that it should be first-hand, not second-hand. In other words, the actual recovery of past incarnations is an experience of altogether different caliber to having them read, by a clairvoyant, however accurate. It is not without its value to have the record checked by a reliable clairvoyant, but the smallest fragment that we recover for ourselves is of infinitely greater value to us than the most accurate and complete record read off from the reflecting ether by another. All the sting is gone from death the moment that we have glimpsed some authentic record of our personal past, for we know then from personal experience the immortality of the soul and its independence of bodily existence. It is well worthwhile to wait patiently till our own hands can draw back the curtain, rather than have recourse to the clairvoyance of another and so miss this great experience in order to unveil the past with accuracy and with security from self-delusion. It is necessary to understand the basic principle of the doctrine of reincarnation. The esotericist recognizes two aspects of man, the higher self and the lower self. The higher self is a single unified whole which builds up around the divine spark, which is the nucleus of each human manifestation. The lower self is not a unified whole but an ever-changing series of partial manifestations of the higher self, projected down into the planes of form and clothed upon with matter. The higher self is often spoken of as the individuality, and each lower self as the personality. The word individuality has for its root meaning that which cannot be divided, in other words, a unit. The word personality is derived from the Latin persona, or mask. In ancient Greece, the players in the sacred mystery plays, which formed part of the Dionysiac mysteries, always wore masks, which were conventional representations of the part they took. We can readily imagine the player in the course of the play cycle, which formed part of the mystery celebrations, assuming first one mask and then another as his parts changed with the play that was being performed. Thus do we conceive of the emotion mortal soul and the mysteries. We think of it as assuming first one personality, persona, or mask, after another as it plays its allotted part in the successive mystery plays, which form the changing cycle of spiritual experience. At the end of each incarnation, the form aspect of the persona disintegrates and returns as dust to dust according to its plane. For the ensouling life which built it up and which holds all together is withdrawn. First the body, then the etheric double, then the astral form, and finally the concrete mind. All go thus, dust to dust back to the abyss of primordial matter, whence they were wrought into living substance by the breath of air that ensouled them. Nothing remains of these save the tracks in space, which they wore by the habitual reactions of their nature. These are sometimes called the shadows on the reflecting ether. It is not easy to understand an idea so foreign to our mundane experience, but if we think of the reflecting ether, or akasha, which is the aura of the earth as a sensitive plate, upon which is photographed every reflection that has ever fallen upon it, and from which it is possible, by appropriate means, which will be considered later to pick out and develop single impressions at will. We shall have a rough approximation to an understanding of the process. It is the reading of the Akashic records that is done by clairvoyants when they look up the past for a client, but it is something quite different to which we do for ourselves when we remember our own past incarnations. And it is this latter process which is of such value to us. It is much more likely to be these Akashic reflections which are dramatized 
by the subconscious mind of the medium than any actual return of the dead in propria persona. When communication with the departed takes place, this is the weak spot in spiritualistic manifestations and explains the trifling and fragmentary nature of so much that is communicated by the so-called spirits of the departed. When we revive our own memories, however, a different process takes place, and this will best be understood if we carry our investigation of the processes of death a step farther. As each of the four bodies of form disintegrates, its essential essence is absorbed by the immortal and eternal higher self or individuality of the person. It is this absorption which, by withdrawing the higher principles, in fact, causes the dissolution of the so form bodies. After the physical vehicle, their essential instrument of manifestation and means of experience is rendered unfit for use either by age, accident, or disease. It will be seen from this that the actual form aspect of each incarnation is dissolved and done with after each incarnation, but that its essential essence, the right fruit of experience, is absorbed by the higher self. Thus does the higher self grow and evolve. It might aptly be said that the soul grazes in the fields of earth and lies down to chew the cud beside the still waters of heaven. It follows then that the only thing that persists, incarnation after incarnation, is this spiritual principle, the ethical essence extracted from the sum total of the experiences of each earth life the life itself and its memories going into the discard after it has, as it were, been sucked dry by this soul which requires of it only, this spiritual essence for its nutriment. Let us now study the way in which memory is evoked. We can learn a great deal about this by observing what happens when we try to recite a poem of which we have not got too distinct a recollection. We know how hopeless it is to make a start unless someone can prompt us to the first line. Once we have that, off we go gaily, the poem unwinding itself spontaneously out of our subconscious memory until the thread of association breaks and we are once more in need of the indispensable help of the prompter if we are to start off afresh. Stored in the akasha or reflecting ether as previously described are the memories of everything that has ever happened within the earth sphere. If we can by any means secure the prompt to any particular set of memories, we can unwind them out of the aspect of subconsciousness in ourselves, which corresponds to the akasha. We have, of course, a natural link in connection with anything that happened in one of our own previous incarnations. We cannot, however, pick this up on the planes of form, that is, of the concrete mind, by taking conscious thought, because there is no direct link between one incarnation and another on the planes of form. But we can pick it up via the higher self if we are able to think with the higher type of mentation, even if it only be for a brief flash. In order to achieve this, we must consider our present life as a whole and see if we can discern any recurring problem in it, for such a problem will probably be due to karmic causes. Consequently, it will have its root in past incarnations, and we can use it as a guide rope to cross the gulf fixed in the continuity of consciousness by each experience of death that we have undergone. It will thus be seen that we have followed this guide rope up onto the level of the higher self by meditating upon the abstract essence of the experiences we have recognized to be karmic, that is, to be the immediate outcome of past lives. Our next problem is to follow our guide rope down again onto the planes of form at a diverging angle from normal consciousness. The translation of consciousness from one plane to another is best achieved by availing ourselves of the resources placed at our disposal by the simple and universal experience of sleep when the normal concrete consciousness is in abeyance. The five physical senses are closed down, and subconsciousness, with all it contains, is left unguarded and undisciplined for a space. After the light is extinguished, let us sink deeply into meditation on the spiritual essence that we have divined as being at the root of a particular set of karmic experiences. 
we have selected for examination, but let us carefully refrain from dwelling upon these experiences in any shape or form, and let us equally carefully refrain from passing any moral judgment on them, or formulating any good resolutions arising out of them. We must simply think of these experiences as the food of the soul and as teaching it certain lessons. Let us continue like this between sleeping and waking, making no effort of the will to keep ourselves awake until fragments and flashes of pictures begin to rise in the imagination. These the orthodox scientist calls hypnagogics and has little realization of their significance nor of the uses to which they can be put. We should never strain after these pictures nor make any conscious effort to formulate them. They must arise spontaneously if they are to be any use to us. Let us remember that the skill in the use of this method lies in catching the impressions which are available to us as the mind crosses over from one state of consciousness to another and the two levels are momentarily blended. Then we are, in the words of astrology, on the cusp of consciousness and subconsciousness. We must always bear in mind that the fact that the impressions that have value are the spontaneous ones, because these alone well up from the subconsciousness. The willed and directed ones are of the conscious mind, and these have no particular interest for us because we can command them at will. Consequently, let us have patience with ourselves and remember that there is a knack to be acquired in the recovery of those impressions perceived when two opposite doors of the chambers of the mind happen to be open simultaneously. The trick lies in sliding easily and effortlessly from one state of consciousness to another with the mind's eyes open. It is a trick that has to be learnt, like the art of balancing on a bicycle, and we must be content to try many times with the most fragmentary results before we can count upon getting anything worth having, though in some cases it may occasionally be that immediate results are obtained because the memories happen to be lying near the surface, but these are rare. When a definite reincarnation memory is obtained, it is usually recognized by the emotion that surrounds it. We may see a perfect phantasmagoria of the past floating before the mind's eye as we lie between sleeping and waking in the darkness and silence, but it will have no special significance for us beyond that of a generalized beauty and interest. But when a fragment of one of our own authentic memories crops up, it will bring with it all its attendant emotional association, even if it be no more than a glimpse of the wall of a house where a physical tenement once dwelt. It is this uprush of emotion that tells us that we are on the right track. The moment this occurs, we ought to rouse ourselves and concentrate on this fragment so that we shall ensure that it shall not sink back into subconsciousness and be lost to us. It is a good plan to have paper and pencil beside the bed and to turn on the light and make notes or a rough sketch. In so doing, we shall probably sacrifice a night's sleep for these memories of the past are upheaving things when they reappear, but they need not necessarily be painful things, it may in fact be the fascination of them that drives sleep away for some hours. Therefore, together with the writing materials to record the experience, we should also have the means of a light meal such as biscuits and milk, in order that the gates may be closed again when the opening has been explored. For there is no formula so effective for closing the gates of consciousness as a little food in the stomach, especially hot food. Next day we ought to try and ascertain to what period of history and to what country the fragment we have recaptured belongs and then soak ourselves in the literature of that period and country. To this end, historical novels are very useful for they help us most effectually to see the past as a living human experience and not as a dry-as-dust record in a museum. To this end, we should also try to obtain illustrations of this epoch and place, and especially to see and, if possible, handle the actual relics of it such as may be found in museums. If we can, by any fortunate chance, possess ourselves of some authentic relic of this past, which shall act as a magnetic link 
Our experiment is greatly simplified, and whatever we obtain will come with much greater vividness. The imagination will gradually build up a picture of this time and place, and if we are wise, we shall limit ourselves strictly to one incarnation at a time, for we shall not only become confused, but form a very bad psychic habit. If we let the pictures of two or more incarnations run together and superimpose themselves on one another, like two exposures on one plate of a camera. When the conscious mind has supplied itself with the necessary furniture and properties, we shall find that the fragments of memory are beginning to use these symbols and pictures in order to clothe themselves with flesh and dwell among us, as it were. In other words, the conscious mind is using these symbols and pictures to give form to these intangible impressions that are rising to the surface of the subconscious mind under the invocation of our interest and desire. We shall always know any genuine memory by the emotion it evokes. Once a definite set of memories has begun to formulate itself into something coherent, we shall find comparatively little difficulty in applying the method to incarnation after incarnation, though we shall always find it easier to get the memories of incarnations when the body was of the same sex as the present one than to recall memories of incarnations when it was of the opposite sex. When we have gained proficiency in the method, however, it is a valuable experience to force the mind to recall memories of incarnations in a body of the opposite sex to that which we now occupy, for it gives a great expansion of consciousness and understanding and is an experience never to be forgotten.